Hey guys, want to welcome you to another edition of Halftime Chats. And today I am happy to welcome record executive, record producer, and even now gospel artist, Mr. Stanley Brown. Um, He's been involved, I think he did pre-produce Don't uh, I'm Dreaming with Crystal Williams, he has worked with Ron DMC, LL Cool J. He's worked with Jackie McGee. He's worked across the um, the industry um, back in the 90s. Then he moved to become an executive. And now he formed his own record label and um, about to release his own solo project. So it's going to be great listening to Stanley here about his career, um, behind the scenes stuff. And um, yeah, we just take it from there. Okay, we're about to in, bring in Stanley into the system. Everybody can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, yes. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. Okay. Definitely, it's a privilege to be able to speak with you. And come from your studio, I see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Question, how do you, what is the correct pronunciation of your name? Uh, so I know the double N, it's Namdi. Namdi, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, my parents yes. are Nigerian, um, so you know I was born here. Yeah, Nigerian, so it's a Nigerian name. Okay. Yes. Namdi, yes. Man. This is great. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm looking yeah. forward to this. Yeah, definitely. Now, we've got an international audience. Um, I'm here in the UK. We've got people from Nigeria, America, UK, around the world who listen in. So I always stop my interview back to my guests where you sort of Born and raised, so we can get a, a sort of a geography of of of, the, of your life. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so where were you born and raised? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. New York City, um, in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Okay. Brooklyn, New York. Yes. Okay. Now, for yes. for those of us who um are, are you know, familiar with American culture, we we hear Brooklyn and we think of Biggie. And uh, you know they then they seem to have amplified the, the city of Brooklyn. But what's it like? What was it like growing up in Brooklyn? I mean, I grew up in the days where there were um, kids playing outside, stick ball, you know, basketball hoops, um, block parties. You know, it was just it was just an amazing time. You know, growing up in um, Bedford Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, actually where Biggie Smalls. Was 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 born and living, um, and Jay Z and Big Daddy Kane and all of these guys. Um, so I grew up right in the heart of of Bedford Stuyvesant. So for me, the child, my childhood was a lot of fun. You know, back in those days, I'm the kids went outside and played stickball and baseball, and um, so when we when I wasn't playing stickball or any sports, I was always playing instruments inside the house you know my brothers were djs so i would i would mess around with their um turntables and listen to their albums and records and that's how i fell in love with music okay and then you know what was your family how many was it, how many what was the size of your family seven boys <laughs> seven <laughs> brothers seven brothers and one sister wow yes my goodness! I mean, that's that yeah. sounds like um, <laughs> how how did your parents cope with having seven kids? Well, we had I I came up in a um one parent home, um just my oh. mother, who did an amazing job raising uh seven boys and one girl by herself. You know, um, it was it was something to see the the strength of a woman, um, but it was fun. Because it was it was all you know majority of boys and a lot of wrestling and boxing and 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 re, you know and playing sports together and arguing you know all all the things that boys do, so it was an amazing, warm, loving household, my entire life. So out of the eight, where are you in the middle? The oldest, the youngest? I'm, I'm next to the youngest. Okay. 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 So you are the Randy Jackson of the family, right? So... I'm the Randy Jackson. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the Randy Jackson. Yes. Okay. Okay. Wow. But then, it, 
uh, so w- was did you have um was did your mom have it was your dad the children of all the father of all eight of you oh uh, yes okay yes <clears throat> and but he left and it so just left your mom yeah whole story behind that yeah that's that's for the book <laughs> okay <laughs> okay that, that, that's fine but um how did that affect you though just um i mean how old were you when he left and just just to uh, um, probably seven, eight. I don't, I don't, I don't know, you know, but for me having older brothers who were like brothers and father figures, you know, I didn't, I didn't miss it to be honest with you, because I've, I had, uh, amazing brothers, older brothers who were just great guys, you know, hardworking, um, brothers loving brothers, caring brothers. So I never felt absent of, of an example, mm-hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? Or, or, or elderly or father figure, because my brothers were always all things to me. Your oldest brother, what's, what's the, what was the, what's the age gap? So when you were seven, how old was he? The oldest? I have, you, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how my brothers are. Oh goodness! <laughs> There's so many of them, I lose count. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. So I'm the eldest. So I have no idea what it's like being the youngest. I'm thinking if you've had yeah. eight people exactly. ahead of you, what's the okay? Exactly. Okay. So g- getting into the music, then um, did the um, I, I mean how you mentioned about the play turntables and listen to records, the actual instruments itself. Did you ever get to touch those and and yes actually my oldest brother thomas we call him sunny he always had turntables and mixers in a house so i would just mess around with his his equipment while he was at work i would sneak into his room <laughs> and mess around with his gear and i would get in trouble for it later but um other than outside of that um we we were a strong spiritual family um grew up in a church um back in those days I mean, we went to church all the time. For me, as a young kid, I, it almost felt like we were in church seven days a week. <laughs> so that's when I learned how to play the drums and fell in love with playing the drums. Because in my day, say, if you went to church in the morning, you didn't get home till late at night because there was a morning service. Uh-huh. Then it was an afternoon service. And then it was an evening service, right? So in between those services... I would mess around with the drums and my mother saw that I had some interest in drums and she brought, she invested and brought me a drum set. And um, that's really how things started for me as a musician. Okay. So it's when you say drum set, this isn't like the machine. It's the actual set of drums. Actually a set of drums. Okay. Actually a set of drums. That was the first instrument that I, I learned to play. And then I started playing keyboards and organ and things like that. So, but the drums initially was my first instrument. Now, you know, when you think of drums, you think of noise and you think of how, unless you had a garage at the back and you play your drums, where were you playing your drums? Oh, it was, it was loud. It was definitely loud in the house. And the neighbors didn't <laughs> seem to bother with you. This, your kids nobody, playing... didn't, nobody bothered. They didn't care. I was just a kid playing the drums. They were okay with it. Wow. <laughs> so did, did you, did you play not just in church, but did you play with the band or what was your sort of schooling? As I, as I got older, um, I played with some kids in the neighborhood. You know, we would call ourselves having a band. Um, but and like I said earlier, Namdi, in those days, there were a lot of what we call block parties where they would block off the streets and they would have food on the streets and all type of activities for the kids. But there were always live bands wow. um, that were just come outside of their house in their front doors and they would just play full bands. And I would, that's when I was really captivated and I was mesmerized by the music. And I would sit there for hours and hours and hours just watching these bands play. And that's what started to form my love and desire to really, really want to be a musician. Wow. Now, in, in those days, had uh, when you were young, had hip hop Take taken off, or was it? What was the music that you were inspired by as a kid? 
I was I was just inspired by all music and especially gospel music, like uh -huh. the Hawkins family, listening to the Hawkins family on the radio and then going to church. You know, we had amazing choirs and music departments and, you know, the the I grew up in a church where there was a, a phenomenal musician in every church. So that kind of that's what sparked me and wanted and made me want to be able to learn even more and go deeper in the craft. But that's really what started to steer me. It seems as if the, that in the sort of the 80s, um, the church was the breathing ground for a lot of our producers and singers of the 90s. Um, but then what happens in the 70s and, the, and 60s? I, I don't know if they still were learning in church or, or something different, but it just seems as if majority of our 90s of all would go back to church singing playing and and getting all that stuff from the church what what was it about sort of the environment of the church when it came to playing music that you think helped you hone your craft as a as a musician and a producer uh being just being in the environment you know choir rehearsals um my mother was a singer Okay. Um, she was saying she was one of the lead singers at our church, but my grandmother was a musician. My grandmother was an organist oh, in, in in Columbia, South Carolina, Carolina, where I would spend a majority of my summers um, in South Carolina with my grandmother, watching her teach the choir, watching her teach piano and singers at the senior citizens centers. Mm. Um, I just had to sit there for hours upon hours and watch that. Um, because I couldn't, there was nothing else to do. Um, so all of that um, played a part in, sh in in shaping what would later on become something um, that um, I would learn to love. Yeah. The um at at that point in time, the um when you're pl playing the music, how much of the sort of the the spiritual aspect of of being in a church were you taking in? Or were you just like, okay, good, I'm going to church so I can play the music? Man, it was, I grew up in um a very Pentecostal, <laughs> apostolic, Holy Ghost filled <laughs> church, man. And not only were you going to hear it, hear it you was going to feel it at the wow. same time. So there was a lot of praying and laying hands on, on, and, and, and on the gift and, all of that kind of stuff, man, played played a part because back in those days, too, not only was learning a gift and a skill was important, um, they saw to it that we prayed as much as we played. Wow. You, you, you understand? So that also played a part in, you know, shaping the spiritual side of what we do as well. And so that's interesting. Do you think... That those who you know, the, especially in your church, did, did they see the the possibilities of if we anoint our gifted musicians, and even if they go into outside of the church to play, they can take their spiritual gift as well as their their uh, the technical gift, or was it like, yep, yeah, we we we're cultivating these musicians to stay within the church family? When you reflect back, what do you, do you think? Yes, a, a little, not I mean, a little bit of both. Um, because there were some churches, um, that if you said that you were going to use your gift and you were going to go play secular music, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that was a bad thing. You know, mm -hmm. they were kind of against that. Um, and then there were some pastors and churches that were a little bit more open and liberal to the opportunities, um, that it would afford the musician in being able to uh, take care of his, his livelihood and his family and whatever his lifestyle required. Um, some people were understanding of that. And then there were another group who were not so understanding, um, you know, to the point where you were almost condemned to going to hell <laughs> if you decided to work on the other side of the aisle. So it was a little bit of both. What was the case with, with, for yourself? Well, for me, um, early on, I know when I first had an opportunity to go play um, with the R&B group early on, um, it was a group called Guy, R&B <laughs> group. 
Yes, yeah, so with my good friend Teddy Riley and Aaron Hall and Damien and the late Bernard Bell. Oh, um, gosh. I had an opportunity to to tour with them, and the conversation at home, um, with my mother, it wasn't so easy. You know, she kind of it was it would be her desire and wishes that I would just stay, and just play at the church solely, but she understood it, and um and and prayed about it and prayed over me. And I started to work in uh, other genres of music. Okay, so before I skip and jump, um, any of your other siblings play music or, uh, as well? Not a note. Okay, so just yourself. <laughs> yes. Wow. Okay, so just yourself. Yeah. <laughs> when did you then? How how were you in high school? And uh, did you did, were you did were you academic and then playing, or what was it like for you? School was great for me. I loved reading. Um, I, I loved it. I, everything about school. Um, but I did fall in love with music. Um, even at school, you know, playing in the little bands or what have you, I would always kind of sneak into the orient auditoriums. Yeah. Um, probably at times when I wasn't supposed to be in there, <laughs> um, and because because they had a piano, mm. so. I would I would gravitate to the to the rooms that had instruments and I would spend wow. time in there playing the piano. And whenever there was an instrument in the room, I found my way to it. Wow. When did you then decide to think that actually I could actually make have a career in this? What did you think of going to college after high school? No, because funny, right after high school, um I met a there was a young man who was a drummer at my church. Uh, Bobby Walker, who introduced me to his cousin, Jason Mizell. Jason Mizell was the cousin of, well, Jason Mizell was Jam Master J from Run DMC. So I was introduced to Jam Master J. I was invited to his house to work on some music, to play keyboards. And I never left. I this is I was like this is what I want to do. Um, I'm in a house with Run, DMC, Jam Master J, Russell Simmons. Everybody's in the apartment all day, every day, and I just wanted to be a producer. And Jam Master J became my mentor, and he started to teach me how to produce, how to make records, and I never looked back from that moment on. Did you know who Run DMC? I mean, did you did you realize they were, how big they were at that time? Were they of, of course. <laughs> yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. So what was it like when you when you first got introduced to I mean, and you know, some we, we talk about destiny and stuff, but why why were you introduced given this opportunity? Be, because um as I stated, uh Bobby was the cousin of Jam Master J, and Bobby told me that they were looking for a keyboard player to work uh. on some music. Okay. So he brought me to to meet Jason, and that's how things started to happen. Wow. What did your mom think when you said, when you were, did you tell her that, look, I don't think I'm going to go to college. I think this is what I want to be doing. She was okay with it. She okay. she knew I loved music. And um, she's like, as long as you understand the risk, you know, you, you understand of of not um continuing and pursuing. Uh, a college degree. Um, so at that point, I knew I had to really, really work hard and I had to be great um, because I knew what the option would be. Hmm. So, okay. So when you meet uh, Jam Master Jenny's, they're teaching you these things. Um, did you have a genre of music that you thought that, okay, you know, let me, oh, hip hop, I can do this. Or did you think about the R&B side of it? No, I just bought what I did to the to the party. They wanted what I what I what I did, whatever with the sound that I had. Um, that's what they wanted because Namdi at that time, Teddy Riley had changed the sound of music. Everything was swinging. Everything was New Jack swing. <laughs> so even Run DMC for for a small uh, for a minute. Right for a New York minute, uh, went the R and B route, um, where they were kind of doing music that kind of fit the mold of the New Jack vibe, but it really wasn't a thing. But 
um they tried it and i brought that sound to 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 to, to their to their to their sound and it worked a little bit and it did well but that's what got me in the door because i was able to um to create music that was relevant at that moment okay so for those of us who um went in america <laughs> in new york during the time when teddy came out what was can you explain what it was like when he was it when he did um, I Wanna or was it be when he was doing stuff for Kumo D or which when 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 did you say he sort of he brought his sound and everyone was like wow what is this? Um, to me, Johnny Kemp just got paid Friday oh. night. I mean, it. I mean, there's so many Teddy Riley hits. I mean, it would take <laughs> us all day to go through his catalog, but. Once them you heard them drums and you heard that swing, um, it changed the sound and everybody um started looking that way. And that just became what it what was happening. And and if you could if you could um emulate that a little bit, perhaps, then you were working. But if you if you couldn't swing, you just didn't work in that era because that was the dominating sound. My goodness, how how does it? And he was, Babyface just turned sixty four, and Teddy's about fifty four. Uh, yeah, um, and he and Babyface said in an interview a couple of a year or two ago that when they heard them, um, I want it. That he in LA said, "Man, what is this? That we need to change our sound." And so you start thinking of Teddy being, you know, twenty, twenty one, or that nineteen or so, changing an entire sound. That that doesn't seem to happen i don't know who, who's doing it who, which kid is doing that now but no, did you look teddy and see was, yeah. he was the architect teddy riley single-handedly was the architect of he dominated a whole era definitely so as a as as a young up-and-coming musician producer of who were you looking at to think i this is who i want to be like as a producer did you were there was it Jimmy and Terry, LA and Babyface? Was it Quincy Jones or Mutu? I mean, <laughs> it, it was definitely Teddy Riley and Quincy Jones, hands down. Those those two were those were my that was the the goals for me. You know what I'm saying? Those were the guys that I aspired to be, um, that I looked that I looked up to and I studied. But unfortunately. Namdi, I was able to sit in studios with Teddy many nights. He would allow me to, he was at Soundtrack Studios or whatever studio he was working at during the time. I was in the rooms and um and even um at his apartment sometime. You know, I would I would go and watch him work and in St. And Nick's. He was just, no, oh, there wasn't not even in St. Nick's after he had moved. Okay, okay. I think up in the upper west side um okay, on okay. a west side highway because we used to ride out race out cars on the west side highway <laughs> you know just doing what kids crazy kids do um but i had the opportunity of of watching him work and that is what inspired me to do what i do when did you first meet him oh my god it had to be in the 80s because aaron hall this is this is another part right <laughs> Aaron Hall, the lead singer, was in a choir that I started with my friend and brother, uh, Bishop Hezekiah Walker. What? Oh, we wow. had a gospel choir. Yeah, we had a gospel choir, Hezekiah Walker and Love Fellowship. Aaron Hall, the lead singer um, of Guy, yeah. was one of the lead singers in the choir. Wow. So Aaron connected me with Teddy. Okay. That's how the whole thing came about. Wow. <laughs> so, but, but so, did you had had um, Groove Me come out by the time you recognized Aaron has already has already made it all? I was there, absolutely. Yes. Oh, you had already met yeah. them before Groove Me came out. No, I I knew Aaron and Teddy. Right, they were working on the record before Groove Me came out. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you get to meet Timmy? I I know Timmy. Yes, Timmy Gatlin. Yes. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, so when you yes. heard "Groove Me," what was your initial thoughts? I mean, it was crazy. I mean, <laughs> I remember him. I remember "Groove Me" 
like I remember hearing, remember the time for the first time when Teddy <laughs> did Michael. Them drums and that swing. <laughs> oh my God. I was like, this guy is brilliant. And it just shifted the sound of black mm -hmm. music. 100%, hands down. It yeah. shifted the sound. When I interviewed Timmy Gatlin, I asked him, he said that he was, Teddy called him and says, hey, come to the house that, I, that we, I've just got a sound. And he got to the house and he had all these kids and people in the house and he and Teddy was just playing groove me. And he says, come on, write the lyrics. And he just, you know, wrote the lyrics just, you know, within, you know, 10, 15 minutes. But he said the sound was just so funky. It was so hot that he just wrote the lyrics. And it's like to think that you can just create um, and I don't know if we if we've ever given him justice as about as a kid in your in your room with no money being able yeah. to generate those type of sounds and stuff. Yeah, it's it's I mean what what Teddy has done um will forever be in you know in the history books. You know, I mean you, you can't talk about R and B in a whole era and and Teddy not be the poster child. One hundred percent. Yeah. So you 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 meet you you meet up with him and, and and stuff. When is this? Then you go and work with um, DMC, uh, Ron DMC, or was it after before? No, that was before. That was before, um, or around actually around the same time. To be to be honest, Namdi, it's really happened around the same time because after. Groove Me um, blew up and Guy blew up. Um, I started getting opportunities because the records on Run DMC was blowing up. And then oh. from there, I was working on Salt and Pepper records and Chub Rock, all the hip hop artists I was working with. Um, and then in one of the sessions, it was a Chub Rock session. I was playing keyboards for Howie T, who's producing uh, this amazing hit Chub Rock uh, did called Treat Em, Treat Em Right. Yeah, I was playing chords on that record. Are you kidding? Another me? producer, yeah, the saxophone solo mm. on that record. That's me playing, right? Wow. <laughs> right, and like some keys and stuff. So, you know, there were always other producers sitting in the rooms. There was another producer, Doctor Freeze and Spider Man, who was yeah. just hanging out, and they invited me to a session um, to participate and play keys because we just worked started working together. They were writing a song and producing a song called I Want to Sex You Up. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That Color ended up bad. on that Color Me Bad, right. And that ended up on the New Jack City soundtrack. Well, I was in that session playing keyboards. And the manager, Hiram Hicks at the time, um, who was managing Dr. Freeze and Spider-Man, took a liking and an interest to me and gave me an opportunity to create some music and produce something. And that's when I went in the studio and tracked a, and recorded a song called I'm Dreaming that ended up being given to Christopher Williams. Okay. And that song, that song ended up on the New Jack City soundtrack as well. Wow. So when, so at this time I was in Nigeria and, and so I, what I, I, you know, I, what I tell my guests is sometimes when, when you guys are, things blow up in America, you for, you don't realize that it goes across the world. So Treatum was a massive record in Nigeria, um, but um, also also that New Jack City uh, soundtrack. Um, mm -hmm. And Chubb Rock was actually a very, he, he, um, he had a very distinct style of rapping, almost like he was yes. ex reciting an encyclopedia kind of thing. Yes. Yes, Chubb Rock was 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 also a brilliant mind as well. Mm. Really, really, really intelligent. Really, just amazing. Just smart. So, because you you mentioned you you were a musician, how did you transition to the actual? Because you know most of us used to think that all these records, you know, they're a whole band in in a studio playing it, and the guys are same ones rap singing over the, a microphone. We realized that actually all this stuff is programmed. So how did you learn to, how did you transition from playing your keys and drums to actually, I need to learn how to program what I'm doing or, or what does, how did it work for you in those early days? Well, for in those days, 
um, we didn't really have the, the Pro Tools and everything that we have now, Logic and all of that software. Um, so I actually play all my instruments. I actually play all my parts. So mm -hmm. if a song was, you know, back in those days, songs were five minutes, four <laughs> minutes and whatever. Like they were just long. <laughs> um, if I was playing a keyboard part, Namdi, I played the actual part for five minutes, right? I will play the piano part for five minutes from the beginning to the end. If there was some string parts, I will play the string parts for the whole five. If there was a bass line, I will play the bass line all the way through as opposed to cutting and paste um, and, the and the things that we have now to kind of speed up the process. I actually enjoy playing it all the way through because it was the little nuances mm. that made the song feel something different you know and feel a little bit different so every now and then there, every now and then there was a different type of movement um the eight you know eight bars wasn't always the same as the the previous eight bars you know what i mean so it was a like little little changes and little notes so i enjoyed that part um but now thank god i have a bunch of engineers and <laughs> young producers around me who can um help me speed up the process no. so i don't have to <laughs> <laughs> no, we miss the old school way of doing it. Music is not the same. I mean, yeah, we miss. <laughs> no, I still, I still do it that way. I still prefer playing the songs and touching knobs and you no know, EQ <laughs> thing. You know, I'm old school, man. Okay. Now, a lot of my guests keep saying when you uh, uh, when you interview producers, find out what um, MPC were you using any MPC? Did uh, what what back in uh, those Chub Rock and 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 Chris Williams days. Back in those days, um, we used the SP twelve hundred a lot. The SP twelve back in those days. Um, I got into the MPC because of Teddy. Teddy Riley was rocking the MPC, so I started working the MPC after watching Teddy Riley. Um, and then later on, um, uh, Rodney Jerkins, Dark Child, you know. <laughs> would invite me to his house and give me NPCs with with amazing drum sounds that were life changing. So, you know, it just it I, I still use the NPC. We have the new ones now. Um, but I still for me the formula is the same and that formula works for me. So yeah. I'm definitely um the NPC is is my favorite still to this day. Okay. Okay. As I said, I, I am the least technical producer, so I have no idea anything you've just said, but I know that the people who are going to be like, oh, he's the SB, what? Okay. Now I'm saying, okay. And the NPC 3000 in particular. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, who taught you how to move from, you know, playing instruments to, so you saw Teddy that was saying, okay, you best do this when you're producing, you can play your sounds into it. Or how did you shift from that to know that, wow, this is how we actually, make music actually is through these devices as opposed to playing a band in a studio? Well, just watching, because in those days, we actually did play everything. If you wanted a bass, somebody to play, the, you wanted a bass part, you, you called in a bass player. If oh. you wanted a guitar player, you called in a guitar player. Um, Now, you know, they have a splice and all these other programs that you can just, you know, uh, drag and drop and blah, oh. blah, blah. <laughs> but, but even now for me, if I want a certain feel, Mm -hmm. I'm going to still call an instrumentalist over. I'm oh, going to okay. call a guitar player, a bass player, and then we're going to create it. But I I learned so much from Teddy Riley, uh, uh, Jam Master J, Herbie Lovebug, oh, Herbie yeah. Azar, who was a producer for Kid and Play and Salt and Pepper and so many other artists. I, I had the privilege of sitting around these genius producers, and I just learned different styles from, from each and every one of them. What did you do with, with Salt and Pepper? Did you do any tracks that we would have? Yes, I I I I wrote on some some songs musically. Um, Express Yourself with Salt. She produced it. Yeah. Oh, and with Jackie, Jackie. McGee was the vocalist. Yep, okay. Jackie McGee. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, Jackie, because I did the interview Jackie and she said yes. Uh, yourself yeah. and the two of you came in to to just to, to shift things around. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was an amazing day. That that was a great session. Oh. It was amazing. So then when Salt is producing, how, what, what was, I mean, cause now it is very interesting that you said this and I know that um, uh, Timberland has said it recently that about there's a difference between a beat maker and a producer. So you said that Salt was producing, what does, what was the difference between what you guys, what you brought to the table and what she did as the producer on that track? 
Well, she she had the overall vision. She knew what she wanted. Um, she knew what she wanted to sound like. She necessarily couldn't sit at the keyboard and play it, mm. but she would give me space um and 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 create a freedom to come up with progressions and she would determine if she liked it or not. Um and she and if and if it made sense, she loved it and then she would lock that in. But she overall as a producer can see exactly where she was going and how she wanted to put it all together. And so that doesn't so she, necessarily mean that she needed to know how to play the drums. She didn't have to. No, n- not at all. But she, but she knew how to find her beats and what samples she wanted to use. So when it came to beats and rhythms and samples, like she could, she was a mastermind of putting that together. But when it, but if she needed me to play some piano uh, transitions or whatever, then I would, I would add that to the, um, I would bring that to the table and then she would use it, you know, as she will. So, for you to, as you said that, so you were able to then distinguish between when, because um, some people would say, no, you produce, you you would have said, well, I produced the track, I did all the, played all the stuff, she just did, you know, and that's some of the things they label with, with Puffy, but, you know, I think I've, we've learned to, to appreciate the fact that the producer has a, a vision like a Quincy Jones, he brings in all these instrumentals to come and play different elements Absolutely. of the dangerous or sort of the bad album or the thrill album or off the wall, but he won't necessarily play it to himself. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so yes. Yeah, so that, that conversation can be interesting and tricky. Um, <laughs> but for me, but, but for me, um, I always knew my assignment. And then if I came up with, with arrangements, then they would give me writer's credits on, on those records. So it worked out. It was always a fair situation. Okay. At least, from my experience. From your experience. Now, mm-hmm. saying that before we move on, I mean, um, as on maybe on the side of being a producer as opposed to being a recording artist, how did you learn about the industry, the business side, the publishing and 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 all that side? How who who, who sort of taught you and it made you sure that you understood not just writer's credit, but making sure that you were getting what you owed you were owed. Oh, I learned that a little bit too late. Right? <laughs> oh Lord, have mercy! I, 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 no, life, life got life got better. Let's just say, now the life got better later on, right? But as a, a young kid coming in the game, um, I didn't know as much as I know now. You know, um, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand uh publishing, and you know, I just wanted to be in the studio making records, and I was getting those advances and. Not understanding what it what it mean what it meant to recoup and yeah. cross collateralizations and all of those other terms, you know yeah. what I mean? But eventually, you know, I figured it out, and I will say, and I'm the I've been blessed enough to remain relevant and to have longevity. Where um, I would on I can honestly say, life made up for uh, what I didn't know early on. Yeah. Now, everyone doesn't have you know can't say that and it's been it's the horror stories but i i honestly can say that i stay in the game long enough um to fix things and to correct things and to make it right yeah i mean it 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 is after doing over 100 interviews it's been the worst type of thing to hear um i think the only two people who have said that they knew what they were doing was um, Joyce Sims. I interviewed her two months before she died and she sort of read the book on how to make in the music industry. So when they try to t- take stuff out of her stuff, she said, well, well, I've read this. And so she kept her stuff. Um, Jay King, cause he knew everything. So he was really hard on everyone. So he, yeah. uh, um, but um, it, so that's, the, but then also take six, they um they got signed to in Nashville and they were offered a contract that country music artists sign and which was pretty much like yeah you you know hey go get your lawyer make sure they read everything and stuff so they were taken care of so but anyone else it it, it unfortunately they did the same Carl West said the same thing it's when you're making so much money early on that you don't recognize that there's so much more that you weren't getting and and that yeah. seems to be a shame for our black artists in our community where yes. we're just taking from ourselves and 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 really stifling our own talent 
any yeah. thoughts as to why you you know coming into the in game and looking back as to why people aren't as um willing to help like okay well, I'll get you in but I'm gonna t- you know I, but I also want to teach you you know ADF is the one person that everyone says really says here's all the stuff make sure you take care of this stuff but very few are like that oh okay who else was there um Queen Latifah's mum was like that with KG. He they they said they taught them everything to make sure that they got their stuff. But any ideas of why you think within the industry that black artists don't seem to look out for their their own? Um, because people are greedy. That's mm-hmm. all, you know. And and they don't have they don't always have integrity. Um, so I just think that is 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 it's a disservice to our community um, because I think we have a responsibility to teach um, and to look out for each other more and to generate wealth within our community. Um, So I just think we have to do better Mm -hmm. with protecting each other um, and educating, you know, and, and it's also important that, you know, the Bible says that, you know, we perish for the lack, lack of knowledge. Right. Yeah. So sometimes we have to, you sometimes you get what you know, or you uh you you don't get you, you you know you know what I'm saying. So you have to read, you have to ask the questions because you got to understand when you take in kids out of urban communities, and you put them in situations where they you can they can move their moms out of the projects tomorrow. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? They're gonna go for that million dollar carrot that's being flashed in front of their eyes and without understanding the cost of that carrot, yeah, you know, at the end of the day. So we have to do better by mentoring and sharing the information and just making sure we protect each other. Yeah. You you mentioned um, Hiram Hicks and most of us would remember him from his role with new edition um, and stuff. How, so what at the, at the time we found you? What was his role? What was he doing? And then he that, that he decided to bring you on board. What well, what well, Hiram was was meant when when I first uh, learned of Hiram Hicks, I know he was doing the new edition, BBD, all of that kind of stuff. And like I said, he was managing the um, Doctor Freeze and uh, Spider Man, right? Freeze and Spider Man, and then he took me on and started managing, um, started managing my career. And 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 as he grew in the business, he made sure that he created opportunities and Mm -hmm. and he would send the elevator back down, as I often say. So when Hiram became the president of Island Black Music, he gave me my first A&R job. Okay, you know, and taught me the game and the business and how to maneuver and how to work things out. And so, yeah. Is that I, when the I, penny I, dropped when you said, oh, so this is publishing in advance in perpetuity? <laughs> Absolutely. Because he was creating opportunities and giving me uh, production deals. And back in those days, Namdi, we, we talking about six figure production deals, you know, and I have never seen that kind of money in my life. <laughs> but he would explain how it would work and why I would need to do such and such and such and, and what it really meant long term. So he was definitely an amazing advisor and a mentor, even wow. to this day. Wow. Wow. So it's so being in, okay, before we get to why you'd shift from being a producer to going on the on on the other side, which is the, the business side, talk about I'm dreaming, because that's that's um that's as new jack as you can. And you know, um <laughs> one of my favorite male singers and 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 he knows this is Christopher Williams. You know, all I see is my one of my top five songs, but yeah. you know, his, his, so I'm not going to play around with that. In fact, Horace said he co-wrote it and and sang a background to it. But uh, I'm dreaming. I mean, I love we all love New Jack City. Um, it was a it was a massive breakthrough album uh, film. But how did you come up with the the I'm dreaming? Well, Hiram gave me an opportunity to go in his studio, um, to create something. So I called a friend from the church, Mark Middleton, um, to come in. Mark Middleton, who's the no, voice no, black. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I met with them. Yeah, my, he was always yeah. singing when I met with. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, Mark, that's, yeah. That's, that's my guy. We um, oh, He goes back that we far. Worked, wow. 
yeah, we were in the same church. You know, we worked at the same church at the time when we were kids. And um, I would have all the guys, Mark Middleton, Josiah Spellman, like guys would just come in and sing the hooks. And we recorded the idea. We gave it to Hiram. Hiram met with Cassandra Mills, okay. who I think was a giant, giant record. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And she loved the song and and connected um, the song with Christopher Williams. And it was a hit. <laughs> so when you first met Christopher um, and he and because he has such a, you know, you know, he's I don't know, Teddy Pennegrass, Barry White, all all yeah. moved in. I mean, what was it like getting him in the studio and, and just trying to get him to turn his he's like a Ferrari to, to help him to be able to balance the song? Well, one, one, it was a little intimidating one because it was like my first big oh. opportunity oh, as a producer. Wow. Right. That's your first and track. Wow. That was like my first uh song that I produced. Like wow. the very, very first that I produced by myself. Yeah. yeah. Right. And Christopher already has this big personality. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um he, he's he's a gentleman, but you know, Christopher can, you know, he's Christopher. He could be intimidating because he's yeah. quiet, he's not saying much, you know. <laughs> but after we got through that, you know, you know, we connected. And then um, I would come up with ideas on how I wanted him to execute the song, and he, and he would and he would just do it, and and we've been tied to the hip since then. Was Aaron Hall around when you were doing "I'm Dreaming"? Aaron Hall, no, because Aaron Hall and them was gone. They was out with Guy. Guy was blowing up everything, so they were on the road doing Guy. But Aaron was he was around for oh. sure. Okay, I think. Oh, uh, okay. No, I thought I saw Christopher talk. You gotta understand, because guy, because guy was on the same on the soundtrack as well. Yes, 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 yes. So New Jack Swing, New Jack City. Okay. Yep. No, I was wondering if because Christopher mentioned that he was recording a track. I thought it was I'm dreaming. That Aaron just said, "Try and sing it like you're doing a Michael Jackson type of stuff." That's so the I, song. That's, that's what, the okay. song. So that's yes, what I was wondering. Absolutely. Was, yes. Now that you yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes, yes. Was he in, in the studio set record? Or how in did the you... studio, yes. Oh, Aaron was there. Yes. Yeah, because it was one like my first opportunity. So the, all the homies, all the brothers <laughs> were just coming, cheering me on and just okay. just so proud because I remember when Dreaming went number one, Um, the excitement and, and, and that Aaron had and, and he was just so proud. And Teddy, all the guys, they were just really, really happy that I got that opportunity. Wow. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, it's, um, don't, yeah. I mean, with, um, yeah, it, it's, so did it surprise you that it did get to number one? Were you surprised that it, it you know, they even shot a video for it, that it was like, yeah, we're going to push it out? I was sitting home back in those days when they had a video music box and all yeah. of that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Something was happening, and I remember sitting on a couch and watching the video come on for the first time. I remember driving down 6th Avenue in the village um, on West 3rd Street um, when the song came on the radio. I remember <laughs> the, everything about that song when I heard it or saw it for the first time. And it was it was just unbelievable to have a number one song like on the charts. I Your mean, to be go. number one on the first go around, but to be number one in the whole country like, I don't care if it was for one day. You got to say, like, <laughs> one day I was number one in the whole world. <laughs> wow. And, and it's a timeless track. It's, you know, it's fitting for your, for your, for your record label, Timeless Music. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Wow. So what did you do next after I'm Dreaming? After I dream, I'm, I'm Dreaming blew up, man, I was getting work. I started doing Charlie Wilson, uh, Keep Sweat. Bobby Brown. I mean, you name it. It was just coming, 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 coming. It would, it would not stop. What did you do with I Bobby? Just, I did a song on um a Bobby project. It was a remix record okay. called uh, "Songs in the Key of B." I okay. did a song called "I Want You, I Need You." Um, Bobby Brown recorded. Oh, and, uh, and, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so I, I I I did that song, and then Big Bub, and today, you know, I did a song with them. So I was working a lot. Oh, a whole lot, Mike. And okay, and if we skip back, because you did remember, you did remind us that you, your your first sort of concert was with Guy, 
how did that come about? Who, 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 um, who, who, how did that come around that you got selected to tour with them? Because we were hanging out, Aaron, you know, they were inviting me to the studio, um, when Teddy, you know, watching, uh, the guys work. And then the tours came about the opportunities and being that I was there, I was in the room, I was there. Um, they just said, come on and play keyboards. And Bernard Bell brought me in and he was the MD, Bernard Bell, okay. um, rest in peace, Bernard. Um, he brought me in cause he was the musical director and, and that's how I got the keyboard opportunity. Did you meet with, uh, me and Gene Griffin? I knew Gene. Yes. <laughs> I, knew, I knew Gene Griffin and Frank and all the guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I I was I was there. <laughs> was he as intimidating as as everyone tells me when you know from? <laughs> well, you know what, Gene was a big, uh, physically fit guy. You know, just with a bald head and a mustache. <laughs> who, who, who? His his appearance was intimidating, but to me, you know, he was always a gentleman. Mm. Always a gentleman. I've never had any issues with Gene at all. He was always a, a kind gentleman to me. Yeah. No, I mean, Damien even talks. I mean, uh, Timmy, I just spoke to him last week and he talked about how, you know, as much as, you know, the, you know, the fallout with him leaving, they always say that Gene was like the most impeccably dressed person with diamonds and he looked like. Sharp all the time, all the time. He was sharp. Wow. Well dressed all the time. You know, and 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 I don't I don't have the horror stories because I never had to deal with them. Yeah. Um on on that business level. I was just uh my only dealings were I was the keyboard player for the guy for a for guy for a period of time. So I really never had any other dealings with him. But um my interactions were always were always kind. Now Sprague Doogie, uh, I don't even know Sprague. Yes. Yeah, he said that they guy he would Gene would make sure that they're rehearsing so that they would be on the top. I mean, did you when because guy used to put on a show to compete with New Edition, but we do you remember any of the rehearsals and and how the shows were? Yeah, I mean, well, Teddy was um, a, he was really driven in 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 excellence. Um, everything he he did, you know, he did it at a high level of excellence. So the rehearsals were always tight. Like we took everything very seriously. Um, it was just a no nonsense environment. We came there to do the work and you were, if you were going to be a part, then you had to put in the work and do your part. So yeah, they definitely took, took the opportunities um, seriously. It wasn't, it wasn't a game. We only, um, the super fest, the, any new edition guy, did you go on that tour? No, I, I I left at that point because that's I started doing more work, more okay. production. So I started on the earlier uh, part, the earlier parts of the tours, and then I kind of just kind of went out to to make records. Do you think if Teddy wasn't a member of Guy, that he would have he would have been a, an even greater producer, just having just been and have a bigger body of work if he hadn't had to go on tour and do all that stuff. Or do you think he didn't no. make much of a difference? <laughs> no, I think he did both and he did it well. Like he was, he was a, Teddy was a producer. <laughs> he was an artist. Um, and he made everybody else want to become that. Like because of the Teddies, there was Stanley Browns and Devonte Swings and so many others, you know, uh. we can go on, you know, you know, Eddie F who you have to, you have to, bring into the conversation you know what i mean who was who was killing it in in that era as well yeah. so there was so many people um and and it, and it almost kind of felt like we all came from that same tree you mm -hmm. know what i mean we were just you know leaves or branches on a deeply rooted tree of new jack swing and um and it worked for everybody everybody was able it was able to have their own identity um but that we came from that tree from that cloth so when did you just um Moon Harum gave you a first A and R gig? Were you still did you think why did you decide to take that and not continue just being in the studio? Well, I did continue 
um okay. to be in the studio. So I was the A and R uh slash producer guy. Um because at that time um I signed well Hiram signed Drew Hill. Oh so you know Woody, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know Woody well and I produced Tell Me. You kidding me? Wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait a minute now. Okay now now okay. So I've, it, Woody's almost like could we do do we do do a different podcast together? And he, oh, so this is yes, Hiram Hicks who, um, Dave Hollister was supposed to sing it, right? Dave Hollister was supposed to sing it first. Oh yeah. So Woody and was Dave telling Hollister, me, this. and Dave Hollister did an amazing job. Like he bodied that song, right? But the only what happened was Drew Hill was a potential signing for Island Records. And there was a soundtrack, Eddie, was the movie called Eddie, which um Whoopi Goldberg, right? Yeah. Starred in Eddie, the basketball movie. And they needed a song. Um, they wanted to place the song in the soundtrack. And Drew Hill, this was a great way to launch uh. the group. So they gave the song to Drew Hill. But Dave had already recorded the song. It was mixed and mastered. And wow. he did. And like you wouldn't have been mad at his version because it was it would it would it, it would have been a hit. It would have probably had the same results. But that's what happened. And that's why the switch happened, because they wanted to sign Dave. But I don't think um, they were able to come come to terms. Um, so they had they went another way. So that's that's what happened. Yeah, so Woody said that when they were singing that demo in the studio, the harem that was singing Tell Me, and then he, he was almost looking at them and thinking, oh, tell me. And then he, that night he had them go record it. Were you in the studio with them? I was in the studio. We were we were actually mastering Dave's version. <laughs> we were actually at a mastering session when we got the phone call that the group was in town and they wanted to meet with Hiram. And the group came over to the studio. This is a true story. The group came over to the studio. We saw the group perform. And Hiram was like, yo, you got to take this group in the studio and record the song. And that's what happened. Wow. Yeah. What did you make of, of them? At, you know, Did you think they're like a version of Jodeci? Or what was your thoughts about the four of them when you first saw them? To, 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 be, considered, to be considered or compared to Jodeci in that era mm. is the most incredible compliment because Jodeci were killing it. Mm. Like Andre Harrell and all those guys over at Uptown, they were killing it. Jodeci, Jodeci became the sound. Like it was the the new blueprint. Mm. Um, so you had a group who could sound that way. And, but they had, they, but Drew Hill had their own, they had their own thing too. You know what I'm saying? But, it was almost, you know, the sound was identifiable and familiar. Mm. And and Cisco was <laughs> Michael Jackson. <laughs> you know what I'm Cisco just had a thing. And then you had Jazz, who was a quiet storm. And Woody, you know what I'm saying? But then you had Nokio, who was a silent killer, um, who I don't think ever got enough props. Um, when it's when it comes to his ability to produce and write, because Nokio was was brilliant as well. So they had everything. They 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 had it, and um, and they proved it later on. You know, because it just kept moving and it kept moving and and it blew up. But when they walked in that when they walked in that building, you knew immediately that they were next. When the song gets blows up, what was? What's your uh, how do you take it compared to I'm dreaming? I, I guess it's not that you can't nothing can replicate the first success, but what was that like when that tell me? Man, I was I was happy, you know, I was really happy, but to be honest, I was really I was really happy for the guys. You know, to see guys come out of Baltimore, Maryland, and you know, with hopes and dreams of becoming something in this industry and you know, I remember when we were recording the song, I think at Unique Studios or Quad Studios at the time, we would take breaks and go to McDonald's and <laughs> have to wait online in, 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 in Times Square. And we wait in a half hour to get a cheeseburger. 
that record came out and we went back to that same McDonald's a month later, <laughs> man, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was crazy. Oh, you know, they was, they were superstars. Wow. <laughs> goodness, goodness. But then <laughs> how, how were you juggling um, producing then A&R? So what was your role as an A&R then? Signing, sign, signing artists, uh, looking for amazing write, writers. I had an opportunity to introduce a, a gospel division to Island Black Music. Oh. Um, they let me sign. They gave me a little imprint, which, which was SBM at the time, Stan Brown Music. Wow. Um, so they gave me a partnership. I was then able to sign Karen Clark Shear to her first solo album. Wow. I was able to sign Bishop T.D. Jakes to his first solo album. Wow. Dill, so, um, partnered with my guy, Donald Lawrence. So it, it, it was amazing. So I was an executive by day, producer by night. Is it by this time that you'd really learned about the everything? So you learned. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was, I was okay by then. <laughs> oh, were you able to write some of the, were they able to go back since you know that all the stuff and you're on the other side now, they would say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll shift things around and give you back some of your stuff. Or does that gone and you'll have to move forward? No, from that point, I was, um, the deals, the, 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 the bulk of the bad deals was were, were happening um in the earlier hip hop stages when I was playing keyboards and I should have got uh I should have gotten some publishing for creating mm. whatever and didn't get it. But it was okay because for me, um it got me to the next room. Yeah. You, you know, so how I look at it is I didn't always get, you know, uh what was fair. Yeah. But it gave me opportunities yeah. to, to to go on to the next. And and so when I got in the next room, I was a little smarter than yeah. I was in the previous. So it worked out. I so I, I when I sp interviewed Rodney, I asked him about um, you know, most of us know him for his faith. And but a lot of us understand that the industry, the music industry and entertainment industry um has a very dark side um how were you able to you know maneuver as a, a christian in those early days um within this industry and all the temptations and, and distractions that could come along with it because i was i never had to stop one thing to do another right i i I was always committed to my church. You know, I was always at the Wednesday night, you know, the, the midweek service wow. prayer. I was always at the Friday night service. I was always at church all day on Sundays. So I never shifted my faith or, or got so caught up in the industry um, where um, I was no longer connected to my spirituality. And it was the it was being in church and still serving on my instrument at the church that kept me balanced. You know, and even to this day, um, when you talk about Rodney, Dark Child, these are the conversations that we have on the regular. You know, we talk more about uh, our conversations are more faith driven than they are pro production driven. You know, so and so my point is when you have people around you especially in this industry who are working on both sides, who understand both sides. And we keep each other um, in check where you don't become where you, where you can be in it and not of it. You, you understand it's important yeah. to have people that you can, that you can talk to. And, you know, when, you know, just kind of keep you straight and keep you centered. So you were still, even when you had, I'm dreaming, you were still going back to church on a Sunday. Every Sunday, never miss the Sunday. Wow. Never. My goodness. I mean, that's 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 dedication. And I'm saying that dedication, just knowing how um everything is can be thrown at you. Um and almost I mean almost as if there's a sense of if we if we bring him down, that's we've 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 got him. And so there's either you know, relying on God's protection and not being, um, 
not just tempted, but been really distracted. So it must be a really hard thing. So how did you keep your studio sort of um, in a sanctified way where temptations weren't thrown in there to distract you um, while you're while you're making your music? And, and you know, because, you know, artists can can be known for, you know, saying this is how I work creatively and, and then producers like, well, anything goes. Well, for me in my in my studio, it's always been understood without even being spoken, you know, verbally or expressed verbally, um, what my stance um would be on certain things, um, and how I pre- preferred my environment to be and mm. what I wanted my environment to feel like. So if um it was always understood and if there was a problem, um Guys who I work with were respectful enough to just go to another facility. You, you know what I mean? So yeah. I would avoid all of that because it's just me and not to, not to pass judgment or say anybody, you know, or to condemn anyone for their actions. I just know what works for me. Yeah. Um, so I just, you know, I choose to have my environment the way I have my environment. So it always, it's always worked out. Always. So never because, been a problem. because you, you'd already laid the sort of the markers of people, like Rodney says, people knew his background, his, his faith, so they knew yes. not to cross the line, so they respected that. It's almost for the ones who who are afraid to, to stand for their faith, they seem to be the ones who have to compromise, and then it seems to be the ones who sort of fall apart. Right. And and and, and to be honest with you, now the, a lot of that, um, I've watched... And I've learned from Rodney, watching how he moved um, in, in his facilities and, and, and watching him work with artists um, from the biggest to the smallest and how he navigated those relationships and what the environment felt like. So that was that was kind of my inspiration as well. Yeah, no, it must be good. What about when you were watching Rodney? I mean, another Teddy protege um, all of a sudden just, you know, from just just become a create his own sound how is that like watching him would you he must be younger than and then younger than everyone else coming through what were your thoughts rodney came through like a mac truck <laughs> and just started knocking everything down you know what i mean um and 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 i think um the 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 the, the vibe and the feel early on had that but we were kind of swinging um but rodney was just coming just on the straight up with a whole nother pounce, you know, it was, it was, it was just different. Like right, them drums and the way Rodney was doing vocals with, with Shiz, LaShawn Daniels, and they just took it. It, then it became the, it, it became the dark child era. Mm. You know, the, the, if the truth be told, there was a time when it became, when Rodney, um, even to this day, you know what I mean? Was the blueprint and, and still, you know, Every now and then, he he come again, dominating the charts forever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. So he never stops. And so, but when it comes to, I learned so much from RJ because when it comes to Sonics and stuff, mm-hmm. like he gets it at, on a whole nother level. Yeah. You mentioned that you helped create the uh, gospel division at Island, um, and and from some artists that I've worked uh, interviewed those who were assigned to majors then they actually went and did gospel one of the things they said is actually the gospel side of the recording industry actually was probably a lot darker than the urban the urban side because it's they they there was a lot of hypocrisy with some of the artists that they felt um i don't know how it was like you know it's one thing recording the music but then do you have a sense of making sure that they're they're living what they're saying, the artists? Well, I, I don't. Unfortunately, I'm not in a position where um, I had to police people's lifestyles. I was just hired to produce a record. Mm-hmm. Um, so all I so I've only had to interact with artists when we were in the recording process. You know, I didn't have to follow them home. I didn't have to go out and hang <laughs> and have dinner. You know, I did the record mm. and gave it to the record company, and then they did what they what they do. Um, so you know, there's stories about gospel artists, just like there's stories about 
hip hop or R and B artist. You know, nobody's perfect. Yeah. Um, but you know, I I can't really say that I've had any issues or bad experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, because I do my job, I go home, they go home, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> So one of the things that I, I um, one of the things because I there was a time I, I worked at um, Edmonds Entertainment where briefly when I was in LA and um, and I remember that I was um, contemplating you know the 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 you know looked at the gospel side of music and I thought that the message was always. In fact, my as I put my kids to bed, they they read the gospel where it says, "I I the healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick." But then it was like, well, how do you get the message to those who don't know the gospel if you're just singing gospel music? And it seems like you know when we said earlier that some ch- churches think, "Oh, you're working in the secular industry, we're cutting you off." Mm-hmm. Did you ever think? about okay if i'm making music i want it to reach everybody but hopefully still somebody will pick something inspirational from what i'm creating i don't necessarily need to put in um you know biblical jesus and and god and and all this just to become an effective christian record but i can make a message a, a, a record about love and redemption and forgiveness but which might come across, which will play on all the stations, but might have a different impact on whoever's listening. Was that ever in the reckoning, or did, were you one of those that thought, "Yep, if I'm doing a gospel album, this is to reach, this is what God's work," and so I'm doing, a, I'm dreaming, this is just to to hone my career, my craft. Yeah, my 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 work, my my occupation, um, in regards to music has been just that. If I'm doing a secular song, um, it's for the industry. I want to just make sure it's, it's it's written well with the best artists and hope and with hopes that the record company and the executives would get behind it. That's the business side of the music, right? Mm-hmm. But there are some even working on the secular side, Namdi. Um, I'm only going to go but so far lyrically. You, you you know what I mean? Because it's just um, how I feel about it personally, my personal convictions. Um, so when I'm doing gospel music. There's styles, right? And then there's hymns and spiritual hymns and psalms. So if I'm doing something mainstream that I feel is a faith-based driven record that I do want to resonate beyond the four walls of the church, like the single, God is good, right? Whether you in Japan, whether you in Australia, whether you smoking a a, 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 a blunt on a corner in, in front of the projects in Brooklyn, if you say to someone, God is good, right? More than likely, they're going to say what? All the time, right? <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to put something out there that everybody, whether you are a Christian, a believer, a non-believer, whatever, um, when you heard the song, you had to say, you know what? Even on a bad day, God is good. Regardless to what you're dealing with, who you are, what walk of life, the fact remains that we're still here. We're blessed and God is good. So you have to know how to balance it out and how to work on both sides. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because as I said, you know, I'm a therapist and I work with um in a in in the in a national health service. But I as a Christian, I don't then only say, Well, you're not a Christian, I can't see you. And so I do wonder, and, and so that's what is one of my limitations about uh with the music industry, that was very much of a either you're a gospel artist or your secular artists, and I'm thinking, well, why can't we have Christian artists or producers and writers be able to write songs and produce songs that the pop or hip hop and stuff, yep. but being very, being very having redemption in the lyrics. Um, yes. You know, you don't have to use the name. You, you know, you 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 could talk about you know you know the greatest love could be Christ, you know, I'm just thinking that, you know, there's so many opportunities, but we tend to yeah. have to say, no, if I have to say that, I need to put God in there because if I don't put God in there, it 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 it, it doesn't, it defeats the purpose. And I'm thinking, no, right. you know, the book of Esther didn't mention God once, but it's just still a powerful story about, about you know, faithfulness and and, and about courage and, and faith and, and, and redemption, yes. but God is not mentioned once in, in, in the book. And so 
I, 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 that's my sort of my gripe with uh, with the with the gospel art, with, with Christians in music, yeah. whether they they stand in faith and are able to, you know, just to let the Holy Spirit just come up and create a song and and stuff. I agree with you one hundred percent. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. So you're an A and R at Ireland. Then what? You know, the we're 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 getting towards the um you know the latter part of the nineties into the two thousands. Music is shifting now. You know, all your Brooklyn natives are all coming up and dominating. You know, from Jay Z and stuff. It you know, what are you doing as a producer to see? Well, you know what. Uh, you know, making sure you be, you're still relevant as a producer in an R and B when hip hop now is becoming the dominant sound. Well, at that time when that started to shift, I was now A and R at Motown. I was a scene director of A and R at Motown under Kidar Massenberg, who was the president of Motown at the time. Oh, Mr. So Neo now, Soul man. <laughs> yes, he's the, the the god of Neo Soul. Absolutely. <laughs> Kidar Massenberg. He, he changed the game. So Kidar hired me, gave me an opportunity. So then I'm over there working as a and R. I'm working on Will Downing records, The Temptations. We working with Stevie Wonder. It's just an amazing thing, man. So I went from one side to to the next where I did more um work on the executive side and then I did produce some songs I I produced the Temptations album that won a Grammy that year uh -huh. so it was always um it was always a good the 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 journey has has always been amazing were you there when um um oh, what's the name of the um profile yes absolutely I was there when they signed profile Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. But you didn't. So when you're there as an exec, you're not working as you're not supporting them. Um, on, you're not doing production. Not on that particular project. I think while Profile was there, I was there working on. I was I was doing the Temptations album at the time. Okay. Okay. So you were there during um, either Chico the Barge as well. Absolutely, Chico. That's my friend. That's my brother. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what was the difference going from Ireland to Motown? Uh, because there was a different sort of management style and uh, and sort of expectations? No, I, I did. I produced a lot more at Island Records, the Island Black Music. Um, I, I kind of lived more on the production side. On um, At Motown, I kind of stayed more in the um, the a and executive lane. So what what's the difference between an an the executive well? Did you did you what did you bring differently um, compared to being in the studio? Did you think you you brought to the artist? No, I just at the I just honored the assignment that was given to me. So Kadar wanted me to find songs and writers uh. um, for the artist. So um, if 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 the assignment and the goal was we need you to bring us some writers and producers, then that's where my focus went. Wow, that's how I would think it's like, well, why don't you go produce the whole album? You know, you produce so, well, not, not, not the whole album, but he did give me opportunities um to produce on some of the records in which I did. Like I wrote on Will Downing's album. Mm -hmm. Um I wrote on The Temptations. Um I was working with India Ire because oh. you know she was newly signed there at the time. Yeah. So I did get an opportunity to go in the studio and cut records with a lot of those artists. Okay. So when Kadar moves on from Motown, oh, I mean, how did you, what happens after time at Motown? How, what did you move on to do after that? I started working for a company called JSM. JSM was a, a, a advertisement music production house where they just did commercials, just jingles and television commercials. And I met the owner and they gave me an opportunity um, and I went to work for them mainly because he gave me a studio, right? He gave me space in this amazing facility to have my own studio. So for me, that was the selling point. You know, I was now able to write commercials, do jingles and have a studio 24 seven. I wasn't going to turn that down. Oh, so people might think, well, you left the, a, a, the industry to do so did you, what did you learn by making that switch? 
uh, it was a def it's definitely a different creative process. You know, scoring television commercials and jing jingles, it 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 requires a different type of creativity. Um, but I wanted, I've always wanted to get in that industry, and I knew that was a hard industry to really get in. So once I um found favor with the owner and he gave me the opportunity, I decided I wanted to explore it. How long? How long did you do that for? I did that for about three years. Wow! Any famous commercials that people might uh... a lot Walmart, Subway, uh, Piggly Wiggly. If you live in the <laughs> South, um, Piggly Wiggly. I, I was uh, I went to college in Alabama. Yeah, I know Piggly Wiggly. Uh, right. Uh, every kiss begins with K. I, that's the theme. Uh, it's a whole bunch of stuff. Wow. After three years, what what happens? Did he give you? Did you? Did he just give you a studio, or you used his a studio that? It, no, he he had space. He had empty room. He had rooms. He just had space that was available. So I put all my my gear, and they already had gear. The rooms are already built out. So that became my production facility. But then, when you were doing this, were you still producing artists on the side, or just that was a hundred percent? No, at that point, it was just really. Uh, writing commercials wow. and just songwriting on the side, just writing for my own personal catalog. But it was mainly doing television scoring. Then after three years, what did you, what happens? After three years, I get a call to do um, a show called Sunday Best. Um, was the that BT? Show. Yes, on BT. Um, I was the, the co-music director with my friend, um, Paul Paul Morton, PJ Morton. Oh. Um, PJ Morton and I and, and, and the fellas, Corey Henry, um, all of us, we were all in a band together. We did Sunday Best. And then after that, um, I got hired at um at RCA Inspiration, um, the gospel division, which was called Verity, formerly known as Verity. Oh, I know Verity Records, yeah. Um, and then um I, I worked there for three years. Was that being executive or yes, A and R. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Under at, under James Jazzy Jordan. He hired me to work work there. So then I just started signing gospel artists. Now, as the industry started shifting where everything became digital and stuff, and especially with, with that role, did how did was the expectations different? I mean, are we looking at streams and for gospel artists? Or is it like if you write a song, we get publishing because it's played at different churches? Or what was the sort of expectation then? Well, that really around that time was we still had a little time before the whole streaming game just completely took over. You know, it was still about physical CDs and okay. radio and touring. Um, so we 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 still had time to do live, host live concerts and sell product at the venue, all of that, you know, the fun stuff. Okay. So yeah, so and that that was kind of right before things really went into the you know, digital space. So well, when it did go digital and hip hop then becomes the dominating sound, what are you, what do you end up doing? Well, at, by that time, I'm working for myself, you know, and just producing. And I, I, I invested in some studios and I just started producing records and doing work with E1, the gospel label, and working on Shirley Caesar records. That was a Grammy-nominated project as well with Phil Thornton. And um, so it just kind of spiraled into the next thing, which brings me to where I am today. So how then did you come up with the concept of having um, Timeless Music Group? I mean, what, um, well, how did the idea pop up after all this time to say, let me set up my own label? Because of the love for it, um, I, I I love it. I love breaking artists. I love working with new artists. I love dis discovering and get, and creating platforms and opportunities for those who potentially have next. So I invested in a facility um, that I can create with no pressure. I'm not in competition with the labels. I do what I want the way I want to do it. and um And we can do it at our own pace. I was fortunate enough to get a partnership with Rock Nation. Um, so they believed in what I was doing. And so we're going to just, we're going to break this and we're going to build this building one brick, one song at a time. 
So yeah, that 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 did come as a surprise. The the partnership with Rock Nation. How did that come about? Uh, you have not because you asked not. You know, I just asked them, and they said yes. They understood my background, my history, um, and my desire for what I wanted, what I wanted to do, and how I wanted to do it. And they believed in it, and they gave me the they gave me the green light. Is Jay was Jay Z involved with that, or does he get it? Does he? No, he has a whole team that <laughs> runs companies, you know? Wow. So there yeah. was um so what what does a partnership with say Rock Nation in 2023 look like? What is it what what's what 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 is it sort of what happens? What's the diff what well Rock Nation from, yeah. Well Rock Nation, what I love about them is they're really into building a culture, you know, um and they they shape culture and they, you know, is is we they own it. They own a thing, and I like so they gave me an opportunity to own my thing. Um, so I love the support. I love um, um, what they give me in terms as the support that's needed in the belief system. Um, so for me, um, it was really about the culture and what they stand for. So to me, I just thought it was a it was a great fit for me because I like what I love what they're about. So um. So when you, so what's your what's the first project with, with the partnership? What's is that your solo album or or the my or solo what? album, which is a compilation? It's a compilation project where I get to work with whomever I want to work with. Um, some of my favorite gospel artists and some secular artists as well who have deep roots in gospel music. Um, who just wanted to kind of lend their support and sing. A, a gospel song or just do something different for a minute so it's really really working the first single god is good with karen clark shared kiera shared kelly and my brother hezekiah walker um um rodney jerkins touched the record jay drew touched the record so and it's really 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 doing well so i'm excited about um what's happening and this is the beginning of launching um, a inspirational division, a brand that I think will do really well in the marketplace. I think I saw a video with you with Christopher Williams in the studio. Yes, with you. we were. Yeah, he's he's on a song. He's on a song. So it's 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 with Jason Nelson, Christopher Williams, and Jason Nelson, and Eric Bellinger, and Aaron Hall on the same song. <laughs> he got Aaron Hall back. Okay. Yeah. It's full and circle it, from I'm Dreaming. <laughs> full circle. Because one, it has that new Jack. This particular song has that new Jack vibe written all over it, right? So I'm trying to wait to hear from Teddy because I need Teddy to to do what Teddy does. So we're gonna see <laughs> that, how that works. Out. <laughs> so the, the the is it is it like a Quincy Jones back on the block or like a Jimmy exactly. Terry volume? Okay, it's, that's that's the blueprint. Okay, so how many singles should we expect on the on the album? Uh, 10, at least 10 to 11 singles. Okay. And so, uh, and I don't, as I said, I, it's not like before where we go, where you can tell the success through radio play and um, people buying it from, from the store. How is the success of a, of a song judged for yourself now? What, 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 what would you deem as well, this is actually doing well? Um, well, well, you can gauge it by radio. You can you can gauge it by chart position. And um, I, you know, the goal is to get to have a top ten, top five single. You know that will set up the rest of the singles and bring recognition to the brand. So if we can get it there, and the world is embracing it, and people are loving it, then to me, mission accomplished. Now, now being digital, they, I mean, music, you know, you don't need to get Hype Williams directing a million dollar video, um, but I, I do. You then look at okay, we need to do a lot of social media stuff and get the little videos because I like the little vignettes yeah. that you normally do um, with yourself in the studios, almost yeah. like saying this is what's going on because that's the kind of backs behind the scenes stuff that we yes. that really gets us in, intrigued. Do you have a team just focused on yep how to really sell the song visually? And all these services. Yes, we have um a marketing team um that's that's working behind the scenes. Um you'll start seeing more 
of videos and of, of the things that we're doing on the other songs, you'll start seeing a lot more visual content. So all of that is in the makings now. Wow. So how do you juggle? So is your role just, uh, what's your role? What's your role now? I mean, being, you know, CEO, owner of, of the label, <laughs> producer, writers and everything, but what's, what's your primary role so that you can make sure that one doesn't suffer because you're trying to put your hands everywhere. Well, I mean, it's it's like my baby, my my personal child that I'm birthing or giving life to. Um, so I I try to stay hands on everything. Um, finding songs, reaching out to the most incredible songwriters, um, producers to partner with me and to do some amazing collaborations, and just kind of oversee the whole thing. But I have a team in place. And I trust what they do and I trust what they bring to the to the table. So it's a it's a collaborative effort for sure. So as we wrap up, when you reflect back on on your journey and and and, and stuff, what are the what are the advice would you give for I would say for up and coming producers who are trying to get into the, to the game today? Um from well, from your experience, from how you started off, you got the you got the connection with Jamas to Jay and and to where you are now. What would your advice be for becoming producers? Just do it and be great at it, and 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 never stop believing. I always say this, Namdi: if you're at a bus stop, right, eventually the bus is going to come, right? If it's a legitimate, if it's the bus stop, right, yeah. the bus. It's going to eventually come. And I say, if you're doing what you need to do and you're where you need to be, the thing that you're waiting for will eventually show up. You just have to be prepared when it does. Mm -hmm. So, you know, learn the craft, study to be better, study from the greats and to continue to do what you do and compete with no one but yourself. You know, just be great and love it. Because if you don't love it, don't do it. That's I mean, it. I mean, that advice actually transcends just music, uh, because mm -hmm. I think about, um, I think about myself and what I'm doing, and think about times when I almost got distracted by looking at different other people who seem to have been a lot more successful, focusing on the gossip side. And I'm thinking, oh, I need to change stuff, and I know right. that my spirit wasn't agreeing with that, but it was like, you know, but that seems to be getting the the attention and 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 having to go back to what the mission is and, and just working with that. And, and, and it can be tough because if you see people stepping out and doing things that meet popular, you, you, you can forget your own calling and your mission yes. and, and, and stuff. Um, yeah. But then I think it's important we hear that your faith has stayed and hasn't wavered. No, I won't say hasn't wavered, but it's, you've been anchored and you've, you've taken precautions to make sure that you don't get uh, sidetracked from yes. I would say your mission. Uh, I'm sure you know. You you you. you, you what 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 you know? When did your mom realize my baby has really made it? Made it changing the world with his music. When, what, what was? Is it? I'm dreaming, or what was the? <laughs> nope. It was when I did a Shirley Caesar song. You kidding me? Way after Platinum Records, way after Drew Hill, way after Dreaming. The <laughs> moment she found out I worked with Pastor Shirley Caesar. I made it to the big times. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't care about nothing else. <laughs> oh, good. Did you get to? Did you get to sh introduce her to see some of these gospel artists like T.D. Jakes and Shirley? Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like most people saying that when on on today's their family see them on Soul Train, <clears throat> they won't. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I always end my interviews back to my guests that. If you're stuck in an elevator, what would be <clears throat> your favorite movie? My favorite movie? Oh, boy. As of late? <laughs> no, no. So, favorite... so the idea is that you're on an elevator and you're sort of stuck and it's like, it's going to take us two, three hours. So you get to pick your favorite movie to kill time. Your favorite movie I've ever, of ever that you'd like, yeah, this is my song, my movie, I'll play it, watch it. <clears throat> Uh, the Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Because there's so many lessons, you know, and I've watched it a million times, but every time I watch it, I learn something else. 
you know, lessons on loyalty and there's so many, you know, besides the killing and all the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, yeah, are yeah. Some, there are some principles, you know, you know, in, 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 in the dialogue. So it's one of my favorite movies. Okay. And then what's your all time favorite song? Oh, Shirley Horn, Here's to Life. Okay. Not I not love her. that song. Okay. You have to hear it. Listen, listen, you should do yourself a favor. Nam D and listen to Shirley Horn, Here's to Life. Game changer. Okay. I'll I'll, yes. I'll do that. Um, okay. <laughs> and, and and finally, I I always have to ask producers when I interview them, who would make your top five producers? In no particular oh. order, but just who would be your top five producers? Of course, Quincy. Of course, um, Babyface. Rodney. Is it Babyface himself or L.A. and Babyface? So because you have to, they're two different. L.A. and Babyface. Okay. I mean, <laughs> okay, you can't just have one because they're two different. Yeah, he I had mean, two... <laughs> Rodney and 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 Teddy. Okay, so you had Quincy. L.A. and Babyface, Rodney and Teddy. So he's got one more. Um, now Rogers. Ah, I love now. I just his approach. I just just it's, he's he's a it's a signature sound. Yeah, that with with his with his with his guitar. Okay. Yes, I love now. <laughs> wow. So Stanley, when are we going to expect the? I know the sing God is good is out now, but when are we expecting a vi full visuals for that, and then the rest of the stuff to drop so we can. Well, we're working on this. Um, we're having conversations in regards to a video, but we're mixing the second single that I told you with Aaron, Christopher, Eric Bellinger, and Jason Nelson uh, next week. So we, we're working on that. So probably another month you'll have another single. But um, but visuals for The God is Good before that as well? Yes, 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 okay. yes. We're just, we just trying to work it out with Karen uh Clark uh and Kiara and their record labels to see what we can do to make that happen. But there will be some type of visual for that, something. Would you guys go we'll would you work. take the the stuff on on the road, the album or the Definitely want to do something. I'm in talks to doing something with Lincoln Center. Um a night um once the, once the pro the project is completed, the complete project is done, we want to probably do something at Lincoln Center. Oh, so that could be the visuals for the album, and and that could Every, be... there you go, there you go, yeah. yes, it'll be a okay. night at Lincoln Center. Okay, yes. that would be good. So something, something to look for for Christmas and stuff. Yes, we're gonna make it work. Yeah, well, Stanley, it's been great. Um, you know, really, it really fascinated by by your story about your, <laughs> um, you know, your journey, but also the fact that you, how you stay committed to your faith throughout that and in an industry that I know too well this it's it, it it can eat you up if um if you aren't faithful and and and, and steadfast so it's been inspirational and, and i definitely would look forward to hearing the full album and 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 being able to let people see and and know um if we um websites and and it what's the for for timeless music group what's social uh, stanley stanley a brown um, on Instagram at Stanley A. Brown and on Timeless Music at Timeless Music Group. Okay. Okay. On Instagram, social media platforms. Okay. Well, Stanley, it's been a pleasure. Um, I know it's been a little long, but I just appreciate the time and everything. Oh, it's been you. great hearing your story and we should look out for a book as well. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so we, we yes, find out 100%. what happened to your dad and stuff. Okay, you got it, man. All right. Take care. Thanks okay, a lot, Stanley. I, I appreciate you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> hey guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for being part of the Half Time Chat community. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, but most importantly, why don't you consider being a member as a way of supporting the channel, but also getting a lot of videos ahead of time, a lot of behind the scenes stuff, and some exclusive content that doesn't get shared. But anyway, thanks for watching and thanks for being part of Half Time Chat. <laughs>